Well, if you'll go ahead and make your way back to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter number 6, in just a moment we're going to look at verses 18 through 24. And while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Does the number 64 mean anything to you this morning? 64 times, 64 Sundays, we've come to the book of Ephesians. 64 times in coming to the well, God has provided every single time, and I trust that he will provide this morning as well. We come to this uh, closing section of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and, and it's worth noting that, that Paul, in this letter, that he ends with something that's very practical, it's pastoral, it's even personal. And it's quite a contrast from where we began, and no, I'm not going to go back and preach through everything that we've looked at, but I, I just want to uh, make an emphasis that in those first three chapters that Paul is devoted to doctrine. You, you recall that we spent a lot of time in that, and specifically you recall that he begins with this rich theology in that very first chapter where he talks about the triune Godhead, God's role in the history of salvation, in our redemption. He, he spends so much time there. It's a very rich and deep doctrine that we spend a lot of time walking through that section. But, but the point that I'm making in this, and the reason I wanted to highlight that, is because he starts there, but then he ends in chapter 6 by talking about prayer. He ends on a very personal note. And I say that he talks about prayer because his concluding remarks are actually that we're going to look at in 18, 19, and 20. And then in 21 really is a postscript. It's more a, uh, his personal remarks. And so the, the teaching that he's been emphasizing is really in 18 through 20, and, and we'll um, look at that as well as we're going to go all the way to the end this morning. That's the, that's the goal is to, to finish out Ephesians. Could we have spent another couple of weeks here? Well, certainly we could have. But... We're going to bring it to a close this morning, and, and in my study this week, I was just so encouraged by this, and, and it took a little different turn than I thought it would, as I just spent time with the, the text, with the passage, and I, I'm, I'm really, I'm not going to make an apology for this. I mean, it is just very, very practical, and I'm, I, I was just, I walked away from my study just so encouraged, and, and I trust, and I hope that you're going to be encouraged as well. But the emphasis, again, is that he starts with the doctrine and teaching of who God is, and he moves into the very practical about how we flesh that out. But ultimately, in talking about prayer at the end, I want you to see this, that our knowledge about God really should lead us to a place of wanting to know God. Uh, and let me put it differently. If, if we stop with just the teaching and the doctrine, and if all we do is fill our head with this knowledge without filling our heart and, and without taking what we've learned about God and that moving us to a place where we're praying and we're seeking the Lord, then we have missed it. This, this knowledge without divine fellowship, misses the point. And so, so all of this learning, I, I, I trust that as we've gone through this study that you have grown in this and you've grown in your understanding of who God is. But I hope that in doing so, that it has moved you to get on your knees before God to seek the Lord and, and really, really to seek to spend time with Him the intimacy that we have with the Lord. Well, let's look at what Paul has to say. I know we looked at verse 18 last week. I just want to read it, but keep it all together in its context. Verse 18, he says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel 
for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that you also may know about my circumstances, how I'm doing. Tychicus, the, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us, and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for this study, for the richness of the truth that we have gleaned from walking through this letter to the Ephesians. And I pray, Lord, that these eternal truths, that you would write them upon our heart. Lord, that you would use these truths to transform us and to change us into the likeness of your Son. Lord, use this teaching this morning to draw us unto yourself. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in looking at this passage, it's interesting what Paul does here in this. As I was preparing and looking at how he lays this out, he starts with talking about prayer. We, we, we noted that last time that in verse 18 that he talks about that we're to pray in the Spirit, and he talks about being on alert in this perseverance, and then he moves to a place to saying that we ought to pray for all the brethren, all the saints, he says. And then he brings that home to say, pray for me. That's where he starts in this. But as you look at verses 19 to the end of the chapter, one of the things that you begin to see in this is is how intricately related prayer and love are. I got ahead of myself, but, but you, you, you will see that as we walk through this. You'll see, in, in other words, and, and you think about your own personal experience about prayer, you will pray about those things that you love. Your, your, your prayers are revealing in terms of what you love. It, it gives us a, really an assessment of our love. Do we love the people of God? Do we love God himself? And what, what are the things that we pray for? And, and I, I think being a grandparent, we certainly know that grandparents play, pray for their grandchildren. I'm, I'm just making this point that prayer and love are intricately related. We, if we're going to seek the Lord, we're going to pray about those things we love. But here, here's what I want you to notice in doing this. And, and again, my encouragement this morning is that you would take away from this that you desire to spend more time in prayer, that you de desire to spend more time with the Lord, that you would desire to spend more time in intercessory prayer, praying for other things than just our own personal things. But let me say what my goal this morning is not. My goal is not to beat you up about your prayer life. My goal is not to, to, to uh, strike out at you and say you're not praying enough. I think all of us would say that we're, we would like for our prayer life to grow. We'd like for it to be greater than it is. I don't have to convince you of that. That's not my estimation, or that's not my goal this morning. Instead, what I want to do is as we look at how important prayer is to the Apostle Paul in this, and, and by the way, how, how important is it? We, we noted this that in chapter 1 and chapter 3, he talks about prayer, and then here, getting very practical, he again talks about prayer. And it's interesting to me how the Apostle Paul put so much emphasis on prayer. And when I think about the modern church and I think about what we emphasize, you know, we talk a lot about how evil this world is, but do we spend much time in talking to God about how evil this world is and how we might be used of Him to change this world? Paul, for Paul, prayer is a part of who he is. It is, as we emphasized last week, it is the very breath of what it means to be a Christian. I mean, prayer is something that we should be living by. But I, I want you to know, I'm going to give you a roadmap where we're going this morning. 
as we look at this, I, I noted that there's there's um, a, a, there's some couples in here. Now I say couples. There, there's two things. In other words, there's three couples. Get it out, preacher. Just get it out. Get it out. It, it just. First of all, there's two things that he prays for, two specific requests that he prays for. And then I want you to notice that when he talks about Tychicus, and by the way, I did look up the pronunciation of that. I wanted to say Tychicus, but it's Tychicus. All the way over, I was Tychicus, Tychicus. But you'll just know if I say Tychicus, you know who I'm talking about. But there's two, two characteristics about Tychicus in this as well. And then at the end, he ends with two benedictions. So the, there's the three couples that I was talking about. But, but how this relates to prayer and love is that you see, there's the three points that I want to emphasize this morning is that Paul begins by talking about really a love for the lost, and we're going to see that as he asks for these two specific prayers. And then he, then he moves on, you see his love for the church, and that's in him sending Tychicus. And then finally, you'll see the source of that love and how that love is sustained. And, and that's where I'm going this morning. So that's the roadmap. Uh, I, again, this is really, I want to be encouraging as we look at this. But as we begin this, I want you to notice we're going to begin where Paul begins, and he says in verse number 19, and pray on my behalf. So very Humble like Paul is asking. And really, as you look at what Paul asked for in prayer, understand this is the Apostle Paul, and he's asking the church to pray for him. None of us are above that. We all need the prayers of the saints. We all need our brothers and sisters to pray for us, and Paul is modeling that. He says, pray on my behalf. The humility that he expresses in that, of praying on my behalf, and and. and of all the things that he is going to ask for, notice what he asked for, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And, and I say that this is a love for the lost because what he's praying for is that the gospel would be spread, that the gospel would be spoken. But it's really, as you look at what he's praying for, I, I think more specifically, he doesn't even mention the lost. It's more really about the glory of Christ, that, that Christ would be known. And it's really an, an advancement of the kingdom is what he's praying. When you think about the model prayer, the Lord's prayer, as we often refer to it, what, do, what does Jesus tell us to pray for? He says, our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. What's next? Help me. Thy kingdom come. Okay. Thy kingdom come. This is what Paul is praying for when he's praying for the spread of the gospel. It's that the kingdom would come. It's, it's the heart of what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 33, that we're to seek him, that we're to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. That, that should be at the first of our prayer list. It should be at the first of our doing list. Everything ought to be about how can we advance the kingdom. And Paul, of all things to pray for, prays that God would put words in his mouth. And, and that's, what, that's, that's literally what he's saying here, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth. What, what he's saying there, he's not saying just that I would had the right words. He, he's saying that utterance would be in my mouth. In other words, that God would put the very words in my mouth. It, the, the, you, you see this with the Old Testament prophets, that God puts his word in their mouth. We see that specifically in Isaiah and Ezekiel. God puts his word in their mouth and they speak. And this is what Paul's praying for that God would put the words in his mouth. You know, when, when we are witnessing and when we're sharing the gospel, one, one of the things that I, I try to emphasize is that, as, as I'm thinking about personally, is that I, I want to 
be sensitive to what that person is saying. So, so I'm prepared, just like 1 Peter 3.15 talks about, I'm, I'm prepared to give a defense for the hope that was in me. I, I have an understanding of the gospel, of my faith, and I want to present that to someone. And I'm listening. I don't come with just a canned gospel explanation. I'm listening. I'm listening for two things. Number one, I'm listening to what they're saying. And, and oftentimes as I'm sharing the gospel with them, they'll tell me where they're struggling. And if, and if I've got, well, I've got to say this next, then I'm not listening to them. But I'm also listening to the Spirit. I'm, I'm listening and I'm asking God to lead me. I'm praying in those moments that God would lead me in that gospel conversation. And I pray, and I pray often that God would put his words in my mouth. Not, not just his words, I pray God get, that he would put his thoughts in my mind, that, that I would think God's thoughts after him. I mean, that's what it means to think the scriptures, is to, these are God's thoughts, these are God's words, and we're just, as we think what he said, we're thinking his thoughts after him. Paul, of all things to pray for. Can you imagine... Think about the most boldest person that you know. Think about the most. Think about somebody who's not afraid to share the gospel with anyone. Think about someone who you know that, given the opportunity, you've heard the expression that they'll share the gospel at the drop of the hat, and they'll drop the hat if necessary. Think about someone who is bold like that. That's the Apostle Paul. I mean, the Apostle Paul, and yet he's asking for boldness. And, and, and one of the things that, that I want us to get from this in our prayer life, because sometimes we see, we, we oftentimes, our, our attention is drawn to the weak, and we want to pray for the weak, and certainly we should pray for the weak. But we should pray for the strong as well. We should pray for those who are bold, that they would remain bold, because Paul knew what we all should know is that we need the strength of the Lord. We need His boldness to be able to continue in that. Those who are holy, we need to pray that they would remain holy. Because apart from the Lord, we can do nothing. We are dependent upon Him. And that's what Paul is emphasizing. That's what prayer is. It's, it's our dependence. We're, we're recognizing, acknowledging our dependence upon God. We need God. We need His strength. We need His boldness. He, he, he says, put, put your words in my mouth. Two, two things. He, he references boldness here twice. He says that I would make known the, the boldness with the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel, as we discovered earlier in this epistle, back in chapter 3, you recall that the mystery of the gospel was that, that in Christ that, that the Jew and Gentile has been united. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, but in Christ, that those barrier walls have been torn down. That's the mystery. He wants to make that known. A mystery, he says, that I, I, I'm an ambassador in chains. An ambassador it speaks of one who speaks on somebody's behalf. The, the irony in that, or the oxymoron, if you will, paradox, whatever you want to call it, is that he's an ambassador in chains. Ambassadors typically, as we think about ambassadors today, when they speak on behalf of another, an ambassador has immunity, but a prisoner doesn't. I think that's the, the, the reason that he asked in a second time for this boldness. He's a prisoner. That in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So again, Paul is, is asking for prayer. He, he's asking for boldness to speak the gospel with boldness. How do we pray for ministers? He tells us. How do you pray for your pastor? How, how do you pray for those who go to the Super Bowl and share the gospel? How do, you go, how do you pray for those who go to the high schools and share the gospel? We pray that God would put His words in their mouth and that God would give them boldness to speak the truth. He's telling us right here. Well, you see His love for the lost. Really, I think you see His love for God's glory. He, he wants the glory of Christ to be known. But then secondly, I want you to notice this, that we see also in this Paul's love for the church. Notice what he says beginning in verses 21 and 22. 
Paul is, he knew that the church would be curious about how he was doing. Now, Paul was in jail. He was under house arrest. And, he, and he's thinking, as I look at this, because he, he knows that, that they're concerned about him, that, and so he wants to tell them through Tychicus his, about his circumstances. But i got to be thinking that the church is wanting to know, how's he holding up? How did he look? Was, was there time of discouragement or despair? I mean, what about the prison guards? How were they responding to what Paul was saying? And Paul wanted them to know about his circumstances. He wanted them to know how he was doing. And and I bring this out. I want to emphasize this because it's important that Paul's being transparent as he sends Tychicus to do this. He's being transparent about how he is doing and about his circumstances. And and I bring this out in the context of loving God's people, that one of the ways that we cultivate a heart for loving God's people is by being transparent with one another. I I think when I went to El Salvador and a few years ago on that first trip when Pastor Ed was telling me about this, this pastor who was up in the mountains who was having a very difficult time, I think I shared a little bit of the story. His child was kidnapped. They called him. They called the pastor. It was local gangs because the gangs saw the church as competing for the youth in that area. And so they took the pastor's child and they called him and let him know, we're going to let him go this time, but we can take him anytime we want to. Stop doing what you're doing. And there are other folks that were, were, were... we're telling this pastor, but you just need to get out of there. You need to leave. But he, he didn't. In fact, he said, no, I know God's called me to be here. I'm not going to leave. And he remained there. And I, and I can remember that I began to pray for him. As I, as I began to hear those struggles, it's amazing how God uses those kind of things in our life that my interest was peaked. I was interested to know what's going on. I want to know about his welfare, how he's doing, what are the circumstances, what's going on there. And God uses that in our life. When you're open and we're transparent with one another, God God uses that very thing to knit us together. It's a way of cultivating love for one another is by hearing those things and then by bringing those petitions to the Lord. And as we pray about those matters, they become important to us. I, I know you're asking, whatever happened to that guy? Well, whatever happened was he did continue to remain there. And in the end, the government came in and arrested all the gangs, and he's still there continuing to preach the gospel. And I, when I talk to Pastor Ed, I'll ask him about this particular pastor. How's he doing? How are things going there? And Paul, recognizing that the church would have been concerned about how he's doing, about the circumstances, says, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to send Tychicus to you. And I, I don't want you to miss this. Let, let's read verse 21 and 22. But that you may also know about my circumstances, how I'm doing Tychicus. Notice how he's described, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. That, that ought to be the description of every single one of us. Beloved and faithful ministers in the Lord. Not, not just those who preach the gospel. That ought to be characteristic of all of us. But he says he's going to make everything known to you. And and notice verse 22. This is what I want you to see. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us. Notice the plural about us. And that he may comfort your hearts. So Paul's not alone. There's, There's somebody else there with him. Tychicus is one of those guys that we don't, know a lot about. We see him five times mentioned in the New Testament. I won't bring out all the references, but every time he's spoken about in a, in a positive way, he's always described as a faithful, here as beloved. And Tychicus, by, by the way, I don't typically do, do this. I don't typically look at the, the, the meaning of the names. I don't put a lot of stock into that. Certainly you see that in the Old Testament. But understanding that Tychicus that his name means fortunate or chance. 
In modern times, his parents wouldn't have named him Lucky. Do you see that? I, 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 <laughs> Paul says, I'm, Lucky's been with me, but I'm going to send you Lucky. But what I want you to notice is that he doesn't send just anybody. He sends somebody who is faithful and beloved. It, it, it's just like our, our Lord there on the cross. I mean, he, when, when he was on the cross, you, you recall that he, he was concerned about the welfare, the welfare of his mother. And so he speaks to John, the, the beloved, and he tells John to, to look after his mother. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's in prison. No doubt there, there are times as, as he's chained, uh, house arrest, there's, no, there, there's got to be times where discouragement or despair, certainly you want your best people around you at that time. But Paul's concern is not that he would have the best, but that the church would have the best. And so he sends Tychicus, someone who's faithful, someone who's beloved, someone, someone you know, but someone who is loved. I'm going to send him to you. I think about what it means to love the church. It means to, to give our best to the church, to be sacrificial towards the church. Certainly, that's what we see there with the apostle Paul. He sends Tychicus, oh, lucky. I'm going to send him. The last thing that, and, and again, he says to comfort your heart. So he, again, he's concerned about their welfare. He wants them to know what he's going on with him, but he certainly is more concerned about their, their welfare. And then finally, I want you to see in verses 23 and 24, this double benediction. It's something strange because we see elsewhere all throughout the New Testament that Paul concludes with a benediction, and benediction just means a, a, a good word, if you will. It's a word of blessing. He, he, he concludes with that. We think about a doxology, that's a, that's, a, that's a praise to God, but a benediction is a word from God, a, a blessing from God. You, you shouldn't see this, those benedictions, you should not see them as wishful thinking, but rather as a, a pronouncement of blessing, more of a prayer. And this is his concluding remarks. But two things I would have you to note, there are two benedictions, but in 23 we see the source of Paul's love, because you remember there was a time where Paul hated the church and Paul persecuted the church. What changed? What changed was his relationship to God. He was zealous for a God that he had in his mind, but he didn't know the true God. In order to know the true God, we know that you must know the one whom he sent. As John 17 makes clear that this is eternal life. To know the true God and the one whom he sent, his son. It, it is through Christ that you come to know the Father. And apart from Christ, you cannot know God. He concludes, it's, it's really, we don't have time to go there, but really 23 and 24 is, is, a, is a contrast of how he starts. In other words, he how he starts the letter, he finishes it almost in the reverse. He finishes out, verse 23, with peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he talks about the source of our love. It is this love that comes from God. Now, when he says peace to the brethren, he's not talking about peace as we think about peace. He's not talking about a trouble-free life, but rather he's talking about a, a, a life that is overflowing with the rich sense of God's presence. The peace of God. Not just peace with God, but we have the peace of God. So that even in the most darkest circumstances, like being as Paul was here, and more specifically at the end of his life, before he goes to be martyr, even in those most trying times, he has the peace of God. Peace be to the brethren. It speaks of the unity that he's talked about throughout this letter. And love with faith from God, 
this election that we have, we talked about in the first chapter, our love of God comes from God. The faith that we have in God is a gift from Him. Everything that we understand, this love that Paul had and the love that we have for, the, for God and the people of God is attributed to the one that we proclaim. The one who rescued us from darkness and from death and Satan's kingdom. He says, from the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he concludes finally with this in verse 24. Grace be with those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. And I've, and I've said that this is how this love is sustained because there are two things he starts. He says peace in verse 23 and everything that follows. Then he says grace in verse 24 and everything that follows. In other words, the way that we continue in this love of God is only by the grace of God. And what Paul says is grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, looking at it somewhat, 23 is God loved us, and then 24 is we love God. Isn't that what 1 John says? We love him because he first loved us first. But notice this phrase at the end. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. But he qualifies that kind of love, or he tells us what the love is characteristic. He says, with an incorruptible love. Now, now some have tried to make this an eternal love, but really what it's saying there, an incorruptible love, is, is talking about what we read in the Psalms today, about uniting our heart. It's talking about a love that, that is not defiled by anything else, that we have a love for Jesus. There's nothing that would pollute that love. And I think one of the questions for us is, do we have that kind of love? I mean, what, what is it that is polluting our love for Christ? What, what, what are we allowing into our life? What, 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 is, what is interrupting our desire to spend time with Him? What, what is interrupting our pure and un, our, our devoted love for Jesus? And, of course, this is unobtainable apart from the grace of God. So we need the grace of God. We need the grace of God to be able to overcome sin. We need the grace of God to be able to overcome these obstacles. We need the grace of God to overcome anything that is standing in the way of our love for Jesus. And how do we get that? Well, we, we talked about some of that throughout this epistle. But our desire is to spend time with the Lord, to know the Lord, to be strengthened by the Lord. And this love that we have for His glory and His, the advancement of His kingdom, this love that we have for the saints, the people of God, only comes from Him. Spending time with Him. Getting to know Him through His Word. Taking the Word fleshing it out, applying it to the life, but then praying about those things as well. All of this is intricately related, and, and I want to just conclude with this, that I hope that as a result of even this particular teaching, that you would desire to spend more time in prayer, that you would pray for the saints. I, I recall when I was in Bible college, we had, a, we had two New Testament professors and, I, and you either got on one track or the other. You didn't often change. Once you started with one professor, you normally stayed with that. The other professor, I didn't know him, but he always, um, my, my, I was a few weeks into school, hadn't been there maybe a month, and he would say, Brother Edenfield. I was like, how does he know me? How does this guy know who I am? And, and, uh, and he said that he, he would name everybody and I was talking to my neighbor about it. I said, tell me about this New Testament professor. What, what's the deal with him? And he said, uh, 
what do you mean I explain what I just said to you? And he said that, that every semester that he takes the new students, they get the pictures made, and he takes those and he puts those to memory and he prays for everybody. And, and he said he knows your name because he brings your name to the Lord in prayer. And he, he said that he prays, and he's always been that way, he prays for everybody, and then he went on to say this. He said, you know, I recall on an occasion, he said his um, classmate had a child that was in the hospital. Dr. Vaughn was the professor's name. And he said, he said, every night after school was over with, Dr. Vaughn would be walking the halls of the hospital back and forth, praying for that child. He did that every night until the child finally was delivered and was able to leave the hospital. I talked to that student. He said, you know, I, he said, I, you can't know how much that meant to me that, to know that there are people that are praying for me in that way. And, and, I, and I conclude with these remarks to say, Yes, Paul asked for prayer for himself, but certainly Paul is praying for others. Yes, we go to the Lord and we desire intimacy with him, but that intimacy with God ought to move us to a place of intercession for his people. And all of this is related. I, I, Samuel Rutherford, who is one of the Puritans, I'll paraphrase a quote that he said, but he said, I never fetch... And Aaron to the Lord, by that he was talking about intercessory prayer. He said, I never take an errand to the Lord in which I do not fetch something in return. What does that mean? He said, I've never prayed on behalf of others without myself receiving some kind of blessing. So, let me encourage you, church, to pray. Pray for one another. Pray in the morning. Pray in in the afternoon. Pray in the evening time. Pray, pray, pray. Pray for me. And pray for all the saints. Will you stand with me? Father in heaven, we, we praise you and we bless you for this relationship that we have with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that apart from Jesus, that you do not even hear our prayers. And I pray, Lord, if there are those this morning who are not in Christ and not have trusted in him for salvation and him alone, Lord, that you would even now begin to reveal to them their need for salvation through your Son. And for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that we would grow in our understanding of who you are. And Lord, that it would move us to a place to grow and and to pray for your people. Lord, stir our affection for the things of God. This we ask that you would be glorified in and through us, in Jesus' name, amen.